No. Ah, ya está, ya lo tenemos. Pues sí, cuando queráis. Eh, no sé si no. queréis que os presente yo o os presentéis vosotros. No, ya nos presentamos. Muy bien, pues adelante, muchas gracias. Eh, buenos días, haré, la, haré primero la presentación en castellano y luego la, la hacemos en inglés porque no sé muy bien quién está conectado. Pero bueno, buenos días a todo el mundo. Eh, vamos a empezar una, una, un café cine con un invitado uh, que ha estado estas, estos días aquí en, en las oficinas del cine en Lleida. Eh, y el, y la, la temática va sobre flexibilidad energética de los edificios, combinando energía eficiente, o sea, eficiencia energética y también dirigiéndose a distritos de bajas emisiones. El, el ponente ahora se presentará es eh, Manuel Borja de la Technical University of Munich. So, uh, good morning, everyone. We are here at Sydney Lleida. We are going to start a new season of a coffee talk. And in this case, uh, the speaker will be Manuel Borja uh, Castellón from the Technical University of Munich. And the season is about uh, energy flexibility in buildings and in uh, low carbon neighborhoods. So please, uh, Manuel, thank you very much. much. Thank you. Well, thank you very much for attending my presentation. And also, thank you very much in general to Simne to inviting me here, and especially to Jordi and his team for the world welcoming. I've been feeling really like part of the team in these few days. So, um, my name is Manuel de Borja Torrejon. I studied architecture in Seville, my hometown, and I was practicing in architecture offices there for a few years. Afterwards, I decided to to have a more technical background. So I moved to Germany 12 years ago and I studied a master's in climate engineering. And after the master's, um, I started working at TUM. I've been working in research projects and in parallel, I've been also in touch with the practical uh, industry by con collaborating with uh, colleagues from Seville in different architectural competitions. We actually, participated in one uh, competition in Barcelona. It was about to develop a concept for renovating one of the cells in the extension of the city, the grid. And in order to be replicated in the future, we were finalists. And um, two years ago, we also participated in a project uh, of the town hall in Seville to develop uh, residential housing, um, plus energy houses. Um, we won, so now it's been built. So it uh, was a really nice experience to you know, to see how to apply all these concepts. Um, today, um, I'm going to briefly. If I manage to. Yes. So first of all, I'm going to introduce also the university and our department so you know where we are in case you want to visit us also there. And then I'm going to directly jump on the field of research on demand side management or energy flexibility in buildings, in which I will briefly introduce the concept about our, our motivation. And I'm going to go uh, guide you through our journey in researching in this field by concluding also in the current project we are developing, which is uh, the title of this presentation. So in the end, we will have time for questions and discussion. So feel free to ask anything that you want to discuss further. So the Technical University of Miel. So this is the Kirstein Tower, and this is the city center, as you see, with the dome. So our university was founded in 1868, and through uh, last year, so two years ago, three years ago, we celebrated our 150 jubilee. It was uh, founded by uh, King Ludwig II, who's uh, not here. Um, through all the story, we have had a lot of renewing members 
I can highlight, for example, Falcon Linden, which uh, did a lot of research in uh, refrigeration engineer. He developed refrigeration machines even before Cargill developed their ACs for buildings. He was focusing mostly in food and conservation, also beer conservation. Um, a couple of figures that summarize a bit like TUM production. So uh, we were recently ranked as uh, the first position in the Times Highest University in Germany and the EVE. Um, worldwide, we are ranked at the 56th position according to Shanghai ranking. Um, we have more than 50,000 students in last semester, about more than 1,000 uh, doctorate students are completing their studies every year. And um, as we are in a, a, a part here, maybe this figure is also interesting for you. We have a volume of four, 430 million euros of third party funding last year, so in 2021. Um, we got like 18 Nobel Prizes and recently one Pritzker Prize, which is the Nobel in Architecture. Our department belongs to the architecture department, so we are really very glad that one of our colleagues uh, obtained that award. So as you see here, this is the evolution of number of students. It's interesting because between 2005 and 15, we doubled the amount of students, and this the same trend is, has been followed from 2010 to 12, uh, 22. Again, it doubled. So now the university is highly growing. And we are also experiencing some restructuring in order to do more efficient conservative, the whole administration and so on. Uh, apart from the location in Munich, TUN has also seven global locations. We have, let's say, offices in San Francisco, Brussels, Cairo, Sao Paulo, Mumbai, Beijing, and Singapore. Um, we, what we, we try to do there is also in start collaborations with local universities, uh, enhance the exchange of the student researchers, and so on. This would be the location in Munich. This is the map of Munich. The campus of the Technical University of Munich is not concentrated in, one, in just one spot, but it's distributed for the whole city. And there are like several main campuses, let's say, we are located pretty much in the city center, close to the city center. And um, this could be the Munich campus, we call it. Uh, there are several departments, among them architectural department, in which is located our chair, which is right here on top of this building. This is the entrance. This is a building complex with different buildings from different periods. And you can read somehow the history of the university by going through the buildings and so on. Uh, and yes, so it's a toy. Our chair is located here. That uh, gives us the opportunity to enjoy such a nice view sometimes in very hard working days. Mm -hmm. At the end of the day, it's, uh, um, it's the share of building technology and climate responsive design, led by Professor Thomas Power. This is our team. We are one of the largest group at the Department of Architecture. Um, we have like eight nationalities within our team. It's a very young, energetic team, like yours. <laughs> um, and within this uh, group, we also have a junior research group, Clean Below, which uh, is leaded by Dr. Claudia Hamela. And uh, we focus, it started with a project focusing in the Balancing the introduction of green and PV in facades, like vertical facades, and trying to find a threshold in order to improve outdoor environmental quality, but also uh, gain, gain renewable energy production, and also seeing how the cooling effect of greening could enhance the production of PV in the city. So our philosophy is sustainability, sustainability driven by design, which means this is a very user-centered approach 
in which we take into account the needs of the users. And we understand that we have to give a response to the local context. So what we do is first we try to uh, analyze as much as possible which passive strategy we can apply in order to reduce the need for active means. And once we can find this threshold, we also introduce um, a use of the active strategy which can enhance the efficiency and the effectiveness of the, the, the whole design. So our motto is in the end, less is more, more sustainable. And I have put here a couple of projects we have had and we are having now, and in which you can see that we move around the area of environmental quality, also energy. One project has more focus on one of these topics, one on the other. And the research around demand side management is like, something in between. Um, it can maybe have the impression that uh, it's highly related to energy, but you cannot understand this without environmental quality and for instance, in indoor spaces. I'm going to tell you more about this now. So the mindset management, I'm going to explain a bit the concept and research, uh, our research goal, but first of all, does anybody know what is the concept of the mindset management? Or can you just say a sentence and try to explain? Yeah. Like to play with the demand of buildings in this case in order to obtain minimize some cost function that could be price or cost or the it could be emissions or a combination of them. Beautiful. Yes, you hit the name. So I have put here graphs and ready to give some images to this explanation. In the end, it's just an intention, intentionally shift of the uh, consumption profile of a building in order to use surplus of renewable uh, production or use energy when the city emissions is lower or when the uh, energy is present uh, and the energy prices are lower. So, this is, for example, a typical uh, consumption profile of an office building, which you see that you have here electricity consumption, ventilation, and then thermal demand. And this uh, curve is varying across the day. Also, depending on, on the, the occupation of the buildings, you have here what peak in the morning, there is the lunch break, the afternoon, and then and so on. And you can see here the, the curve of the electricity price. So the concept is to say, Let's try to shift the demand towards the times of the day in which the crop of the electricity price has been cheaper. And this, of course, without affecting negatively the user and the usage of the building. So in our share, we focus mostly in the demands and management associated with the thermal demand, because it's the highest share of energy demand within the total of our input. And we also try to explore the use of the thermal mass of the building as a um, thermal storage, so as a passive building, rather than using um, uh, water tanks and all the technologies, which are also useful. But since we have thermal mass there available, we want, want to also to explore to what extent we can use it since we have it there. So how can we use the thermal mass? How is the concept and why the environmental quality is important in flexibility? Due to the fact that we can define thermal comfort, not just as a fixed set point temperature, but rather like a range of temperature in which the human being feel comfortable. And we can vary this temperature in the room in order to do these flexibility actions. So the idea is to Use more actively, for example, heating system in order to store it and make uh, taking advantage of this range of temperature, store it there in order to fully switch off for a period of time where we uh, realize that um, we might uh, get a benefit of it, and then keep uh, as a normal uh, uh, operation building. Using again this thermal comfort range afterwards, 
uh, recovering the original state with the standard temperature, let's say. And everything by using the combination of thermal comfort range instead of just yes, unique set point temperature and the heat storage capacity uh, of the thermal mass, the thermal inertia of the building. So, what is our motivation? Why? Um, why we decided to, to go in this direction? So, we all know our global objectives for the uh, avoiding climate change, so CO2 neutrality by 2050. So, based on this, the uh, European Commission has also put a, a route in order to achieve this, in which uh, there are requirements for the main sectors in the economy, our sector, the civilian sector, for instance, in which uh, we want to achieve an 80 95% of CO2 reduction by 2050. From the lens you see, they have analyzed the current situation and with the current policy, there is a gap here that we somehow need to cover through other means rather than typical renovation, production of TV and so on. So what could we do? So on the one hand, for the building sector, we need to achieve by 2050 like 90% of reduction of CO2 emission. This is being done by renovation studies, although the renovation rate is not going at uh, the level it should be. And on the other hand, uh, the new energy standards for building affects only to new built buildings, which is a tiny proportion of building within the building stock. So on the other hand, we have the power sector, which is the, the one that has the highest potential for reducing CO2 emissions by introducing renewable energy. But what happened? Here we have to fight with the volatility of the renewable energy. So this is a um, forecast of the structured energy mix in Germany um, in the future. And we see like this part is the nuclear energy. The Germany decided after Fukushima to shut down all the nuclear plants. Now due to the war, they have extended a bit, but it should have been shut down last year. But you can see here like how the share of renewable energy, for instance, wind energy, a PV energy, will be uh, uh, the, the major way in the whole energy mix in Germany. And what's happened? We cannot control when the wind blows, when the sun shines. So and ideally, we should do this by uh, dismantling a conventional power plants which are based on gas, in oil, etc. So what would be the situation in the future? This is what is happening nowadays. We have a relatively low share of renewable energies in the energy production. We have here a curve of energy demand, power demand, and we have here the residual load. So we see here we have some time surplus, but all the times we, are, we have lack of energy, what we do, we burn gas and we try to cover the residual load. In the future, considering this handling of provisional power plants and the strong introduction of renewable energy, we will have times in which you see here to cover at some point the whole demand, it won't be the problem. The problem would be to leave to deal with these days in which we have lack of energy production. And in order to avoid power cuts and so on, we will have to use the surplus in days with surplus in order to use it in day in uh, shortcuts. How can we do this? One option would be to in install um, storage systems. We did a Another forecast about how much would be the installed storage capacity in Germany with these goals. And we realized that the growth in um, storage capacity installed in Germany in the future will grow exponentially at a point that uh, is really unlikely that we could do this in a sustainable way. So, yes, storing energy would be. Possible solution, but it not alone this 
it won't be the solution. So we need to push for it and see what can we do for them than that. So and our position, our idea was to explore the possibility for doing something as conceptual simple as possible. Like, why don't we just use the energy when it's available and we try to reduce the consumption of energy when we don't have it? So in this way, we reduce the need for having to store the energy. So the whole idea in the end goes through the uh, concept of using the synergy of coping different sectors and creating like a, a paradigm shift from the building as a passive role, as a passive consumer towards a more active role within the energy system. So an active role as a, not only consumer, but also producer, what we call prosumer, and also towards the, the element that can flexibly adapt the energy demand in order to support the regulation of the loads and the energy grid. And this way incorporates clean energy in the consumption of the building, reducing CO2 emissions in the building sector, and also helping the power sector to substitute fossil fuels against renewable energy. So um, we started working or investigating this topic um, in 2013. It was our first project, low performance of building considering different constructive types and technical systems. Since this was our first project, what we wanted to do is start exploring how to this is the main goal, how to quantify and analyze how was the storage potential of the building and the demand management potential of the building. Our hypothesis was that the building sector actually owes a really huge potential of the demand management that can be used to regulate and to support the electricity. Grid. So what we did is we did a uh, characterization of the building stock to identify which were the building types that are more responsible for energy consumption and CO2 emissions in the building stock. We uh, categorize also the construction technology and the different energy system, thermal system that are uh, present in the, in the building sector. And we created physical energy models in order to run our investigations. So, um, then we started developing a methodology to quantify the flexibility potential. Nowadays, there are already a lot of investigation papers that have more precisely defined different indicators, but at that time, we had to start developing our own ones, and which are really in line with the one that we have now available. So basically, what we said is uh, different comfort months, depending on the refrigeration period or the um, heating period. And then we started calculating different strategies. Basically, what happened if we switch off the system? What happened if we switch on the system? So we were calculating so potentials of switching on potentials, switching off potentials. So I'm going to explain this through an example. This is again an office building with uh, boundary conditions and a specific day. And what we start doing is we were preconditioning the building at a fixed temperature, like normally we do in our buildings, 22, 20 degrees. In this case, we, we selected 22 as the natural temperature we took in, in our control range. And we started switching off the system in different time of the days. So here, uh, just at uh, the beginning of the day, we switch off the system and we realize that the temperature can be maintained within the comfort range on the two hours. Afterwards, we exceed the comfort range and we consider that uh, this is like the limit of the uh, uh, strategy that we can apply. So you can see here very beautifully how the temperature here drops suddenly. This is because the air temperature cools down. But here you can see the buffer effect of the thermal mass. 
which is releasing slowly the, temp the thermal energy that has been stored through the bed. The reason why here is rose again is because here start people work coming to the office, and also we start having solar radiation gains. They are saying if we switch off at 6 a.m., we realize 14 hours of uh, possibility for switching off totally the thermal system, 10 hours um, at 12 a.m., or four hours at 6 p.m., etc. So we summarize everything in this graph, which we call a switch off duration graph. So we could say in a very brief view, what would be the, the, the time of the day according to the typology that we could use and a strategy of switching on, in this case, the thermal system. So time is uh, maybe important for the user, but um, it's also matter of course, is the amount of energy we can manage at this time. So we then took into account the consumption profile of the building without any sort of uh, demand management strategy. So yes, heating space contents constantly at one temperature. And we started aggregating how much energy we could manage within the time period that we could switch off the, fish, the system. So uh, for example, here in the day of maximum uh, switching off period of time, we aggregated the amount of energy that we switch off and we started representing this other graph, which is the switch of the initial measure in one hour per square meter. We wanted to do a catalog, trying to uh, yeah, represent um, the potential of the different typology we study. We also not consider only maximum, so long time switch off potential, but we also try to. Um, uh, explore the short term potential. And this is very important because the reaction that the electrical sector needs to balance the energy is not in 14 hours, maybe, but it's rather in a short period of time. So it's important to take this into account because you can see here how the potential, the theoretical potential, can vary depending on what is the need of the power system. We try to evaluate what does it mean, not only in terms of number, but in terms of uh, all this possibility for reducing uh, uh, the need for storage energy with our system. And we took um, the uh, pump storage plant Goldistar, which is the high, the largest one in Germany. And we compared it with an extrapolation of the um, storage potential of the building stock in Germany. And we came out with this number. So we realized that under standard conditions, the potential of the building sector to be able to support the, the power grid is high, it's really high. So this somehow confirmed our hypothesis and invited us to keep researching this uh, line. So other things, other learnings we have is that actually the advanced management potential of the building depends on the building characteristics. So you see here a building with lower energy standard. And here, the response time we have here is very short compared with a very highly inefficiency, efficient building, like a passive house. On the other hand, if you consider the amount of energy that you can manage within this period of time, we see that actually, Buildings in a let's say middle energy standard can play an important role because otherwise, although they can react in short term, short term period of times, the amount of energy they can influence is higher than in passive house buildings. It doesn't mean that these are better than the others. They are they are, they are just different, and they can be used in different ways for long term strategies, short term strategies. And the other learning that uh, we realized is that also the demand side management potential, flexibility potential of the building depends on the climate conditions. And we saw that when the climate conditions are moderated, the uh, potentials are higher 
that when as when the conditions are more extreme and this is due to the fact that if you switch off your system in your house in a winter day which is pretty cold the amount of time you can review you can reduce the consumption is very short compared to another day in which you don't have so much losses of energy in your building so based on these findings we went to for another project in which we don't focus on the building itself but rather on the impact that the use of the energy flexibility could have in the power sector so we wanted to analyze exactly this impact in the power system when we couple the building sector and the, the, the power system and we want also we wanted to study this taking into account the pathway that the German government had to integrate renewable energies in the power sector. And our hypothesis in this case was that actually, by electrifying thermal demand of the building sector and using the storage potential in combination with an integration of renewable energy, we could support to meet the, the climate goals on reducing CO2 emissions by 2050. So in this case, we keep working with the physical models, but then we combine it with a model of the power system in Germany, a model that is very really able to um, run forecasts of the combination of energy that need to be gathered in order to get to the share of renewable energies that it was re required by the German government, and also create a scenarios of how would be like the CO2 profile of the energy production, the price, even though, and the need for a storage system or storage capacity. So, in our case, our part of the project was working with the, the building part. We extend, extended the, the amount of uh, buildings that we could model. We um, put aside more buildings that didn't have so much potential that we identified in the first project, and we also studied all the type of systems. So um, with regard to the um, energy efficiency standard of the building, we, we took into account four of them. One building with no um, impact from the thermal protection regulation in Germany, the one that was the first thermal protection regulation, so between 1978 until 2000. And then this could be the current building regulation, like uh, political technical here in Spain, and um, a very high efficient standard of passive house. So we developed some um, scenarios on how the current building stock in Germany could evolve in the future, assuming different share of demolition and uh, renovation and new construction. And we also studied two scenarios um, associated with the uh, provision of the thermal needs to the buildings. So one, we could call it like classical renovation, in which we transform the building envelope, but we also uh, change the thermal system against other systems that are more efficient, more new. But they are basically gas based. At that time, gas was cheap. And now maybe the situation would be much different. But then we also explore, like what we call a, a sector coupling uh, a scenario in which we uh, enhance the, uh, the integration of heat pumps in the building stock. So every time that in our algorithm, a building has to be, have to be renovated, we put a heat pump as a, a thermal system instead of a gas boiler. So what we find out was really uh, nice in the sense that we also confirmed our hypothesis. This could be the evolution of the CO2 emission of the building sector and the uh, power se sector in Germany without no coupling of them. We see that thanks to the integration of renewable energies in the power sector, the amount of CO2 could be reduced a lot. Nonetheless, only by constructively renovating buildings 
the impact of this measure, which has set an impact, wasn't enough to reach this 80% minimum of CO2 reduction in both sectors. Um, here is pretty much horizontal, but actually it has a bit of growth of energy demand from the building sector due to the fact that we also foresee the new buildings. What happened if we compare this with uh, the scenario with sector coupling? We saw that by electrifying the thermal demand, this would lead, of course, to a higher energy demand in the power sector. But thanks to the provision of energy, clean energy from the power sector to cover the thermal demand of the building, we could really manage to get to this reduction of 80% of CO2 emissions uh, at, at an overall goal. Well, the other things that we saw is that the estimated electricity growth was about 11%, 12% of the total gross energy demand or power demand in Germany, which was translated in, in order to cover this, we will need to install 160% more of PV capacity in the in the country. And we try to estimate how much square meters of uh, roof we would need to cover this demand. And it was about 78% of the available roof in Germany, the building stock. So we saw that as again that here we have potential. Of course there are consequences of electrifying, try to make use of the storage potential, but that there are also possible ways to overcome those challenges. We also uh, try to investigate different application of the flexibility in order to enhance a bit further the reduction of CO2 emissions. And we actually through just this example is doing a load shifting of 25% of daily electricity consumption in the building sector. So just by Applying the concept I explained at the beginning, and we realized that we can again keep reducing CO2 emission. So, um, finally, it reflects project, which is uh, the project which we are working at the moment. We set this time the focus uh, in between the building and the power sector. We focus on a building community, like neighborhoods. Um, and the idea is to investigate how should we renovate these building communities in the future by not only taking into account the classical approach of energy efficiency, but also integrating the ingredient of energy flexibility. So our main hypothesis says that if we, instead of considering renovation of single buildings, we create an overall holistic concept in which our only parameter is not the how much energy we can reduce, but how much energy flexibility we can use. We will create a concept that can enhance the decarbonization of the building sector, that can help more to regulate the power sector. And in the end, and this is very important, that can be a source or finance of financing the renovation actions. So in the end, it's about to consider an open up of uh, a strategy that takes into account the renovation actions, but also the energy flows within the community. And in order to increase the feasibility, cost effectiveness, uh, um, the third hypothesis is that urban typology of neighborhoods and urban and rural are different. They have different configurations, different constellations in, in terms of um, possibilities for introducing renewable energies. And they also have different um, possibilities for introducing the, the electric car, which we also introduce in the equation. So, the methodology we are following is first we are characterizing these neighborhoods. There are already studies that have done um, the middle part of the work. And then we are trying to go from these um, conceptual schemes towards um, 
a characterization of also the constructive characteristics and the, the thermal system. There are already different uh, scenarios on how will uh, the electric car park in the future change in Germany according to different uh, scenarios. And we also have different typology of low voltage uh, energy grids. So we are combining these on these three things. Um, so basically, we identify the, the neighborhood typology, we identify which uh, building typologies are there, and then from here we extract geometry, um, constructive uh, elements, so how are the, the walls built, etc. Manuel, yes. one question. Yeah. When you say you identify uh, neighborhood typology, you mean you, you analyze uh, existing neighborhood typologies and try to define some archetypes? There's it's the same than the buildings, but at the level of. So actually, there was someone already that did that. Yes, uh, I mean, there are already studies that are focused on. Similar to what is, has been done in the building, we have different building types, building ages, and according to this classification, you have the constructive uh, definition and so on. There were also other groups that were doing this for the neighborhood. So now we know that there are different typologies. So uh, this long form, this was more dense um, um, neighborhoods and so on. Basically, what we are trying to do is combining this approach from the neighborhood side and the building one. So that's why we don't stop here, but we move towards the building classification and trying to incorporate like the constructive and the thermal system configuration in the neighborhood. And that means also not only defining the typology, but also the size. Which exactly. When you consider yeah. a standard neighborhood or, exactly. or different sizes we use the possibility for um supplying energy to set the size so the the uh, low voltage grids have different sizes depending on the location so basically in the end um the size of the neighborhood is defined according to how many um supply points can have the lower units of the lower uh, low voltage uh, grid. Okay. So we try to to get to a size in which actually everything is compatible. Yeah, sorry, and the last question: Did you also consider district heating or only electricity? No. We consider district heating as a base scenario, and actually for the urban case. Because it's dense, it might be more, let's say, uh, profitable to go for district heat. But we want also to study a scenario in which we um, cover the manure directly with heat pumps in the building. Yeah. So, actually, one of the strategies at a national level in Germany is yeah, to, to, to go for. for uh, district heating, the sense that you move from decentralizing, having a decentralized uh, uh, heat production towards a centralized heat production, serving the, heat, uh, the district heating, and then by this you facilitate the electrification of the thermal demand. I guess for a uh, central plant power electricity uh, instead of having to but um, the integration of the heat pump also at, at the building level is something that we would like to study. We think that in the future would be a good option. And to incorporate this measure, this electrifying thermal demand, as a measure of the renovation strategy of a building, similar to put new windows, put new more insulation. Sorry, the architects of the neighborhood. Uh, we are using a German project for example, this other one. So I know that it's European for business, but this urban, I suppose that this urban renew 
It's only for German. Yeah, exactly. Forgotten name is uh, studied uh, at the German level. But we are using Tabula project Tabula Tabula for Tabula. the characteristics of the buildings. Exactly. So, yeah. so we said the, the, the case studies and our basic scenario, and then we start like creating renovation scenarios. And what we are trying to do is implementing a automatically iterative way of optimizing the selection of renovation strategies, not just um, create a scenarios for hand, but just let the machine to do all the AA, IA, and come up with an optimal solution. So that was an example of how are we feeding information to our models with the constructive and the thermal system information. In the tabular project, we have all the buildings by Polo and Janice, and there are also two scenarios of renovation in which we have a let's let's call it conventional renovation to meet the current standard and uh, enhance uh, a scenario which is more focused towards the near zero energy standards in the world. and to build up this uh, transformation of buildings we also consider of course we support this pathway from today to 2045 2050 according to the actual, the current uh, objectives of the government. So I told you before that the idea is to reduce up to 80% to CO2 emissions. These have been updated, and now Germany has it as a goal to for 2045 of covering 100% the uh, power consumption to renewable energy. It's much more uh, ambitious objective. And actually, last year, an in between objective was also updated by 2013, so eight years, so seven years. They wanted to uh, cover uh, this power consumption by 65%, and now they have increased it to 80%. So they won't really speed up the process of uh, replacing fossil fuels and also gas towards electricity from renewable energies. So I told you how are we uh, creating our, uh, our case studies and our scenarios. Now I'm going to tell you how we uh, like to, to simulate them, to take them into account. So basically what we are doing is we are developing our own tool. It's a modular, modular tool uh, written in Python, in which we are coding the, the, the modules for modeling each part of a neighborhood. We consider the neighborhood as a combination of the building sector, the power sector, and the mobility sector. And we have an agent, which is the optimizer, which is uh, in charge of analyzing the energy flows in the building and according to objective functions manage the uh, operation of the neighborhood in order to meet a certain objective. Um, we are using uh, Panda Power for analyzing the power system. We are using, using Budogin as the optimizer solver MPC. And uh, in order to facilitate the introduction of information, of geometries, construction information, and so on, we are using also additional tools that are already existing. It's a combination of Rhino Grassover. This is a 3D modeling tool and a parametric tool in which there are components called uh, Lambda and Heinebe that helps to uh, process information and to gather a more structural ways or, or um, abstract way of um, defining the geometry, solar radiation, considering uh, cell shading in the neighborhood, and PV production, considering also the geometry and the cell shading in the building, which is a bit more accurate than uh, just considering the balance uh, on the horizontal level everywhere. 
this is open source software. This is everything open source. I think Prime Service has a fee, but uh, if you have you are an education institution, you get it for free, or you have a discount. Yeah, and the rest is everything open source. I think Hannibal, Hannibal, and Ladybug is developed by uh, Lemon Team, and. Uh, the advantage is that the components you can open it and you can read the code. So it not only is transparent in this way, but you can also adapt certain parts if you have the needs. This is what we do also in our project. So important to mention is the way we are modeling the building because we are moving from the typical white box models, the models in which you define every detail of the building towards gray box models through resistant capacitor models. So um, we consider a building like a combination of uh, thermal units. Each thermal unit is an apartment. And the resistant capacitor models consist of abstracting the behavior, thermal behavior of the building by um, considering like a electrical circuits in which the um, the transmission of the heat through the walls is um, defined by resistance it would be like conductivity of the uh, element and capacitance which we would uh, like uh, represent the thermal capacity of this field. not only uh, massive elements but also the air yeah, the capacity of the, the air and um, the advantage of this is that we reduce the complexity of the model and we allow uh, the model to be combined with um, algorithms of optimization and we can perform much faster and in a feasible way tons of simulations and combinations so here is this um that in the end the optimizer at every time step of the simulation came out with a uh, operation plan for the heat pumps in the building and also for the charging of the vehicles. So, uh, one, one question yes. uh, How did you couple these thermal simulations with the simulation of the green? Uh, good question. Uh, what we do, we, we have been discussing this a lot, and we do it in two steps. Basically, first, we calculate the state in the building part. We stop the simulation, then we, we communicate with Panda Power and calculate the impact of this state in the power grid. And then we analyze the results of Panda Power. And depending on if um, it's okay or not, according to the uh, objective function, before we continue, we change the state of the building part and iterate it until finding a solution, or we continue to the next iteration the right time step so it's like a constraint yes exactly so the combination of all of, of, of these systems is uh, very difficult and we need to find a way a compromise in order to do it possible at a technical way and also the computational and the time that is available uh, and necessary for it because what is the average size of a typical neighborhood and about the thermal zones. So, so, for example, the rural one is uh, 254 houses. And each house corresponds to a thermal zone. Exactly. But in an urban know. environment, it would be much higher. And uh, depends because um, uh, it's, it, it can be. But it, it, it's not a must. So we can also, because I told you before, we want to do comparable scenarios. Mm -hmm. Even though we have less buildings, and so what for us is important is the amount of uh, also thermal zones. Of course. Yeah. So it means if you are, you are doing the calculations and paralyze in, in different cores. I mean. I can exactly. try to understand because this optimizer, <laughs> although you apply the genetic algorithm, whatever it means, a high amount of 
case scenarios to be generated. Exactly. Yeah. So that's why the high computational. Well, that's is a. We are in a phase of trial and error. We we have supercomputers there that can run our uh, simulations and we let them simulate through the night mm -hmm. or through the weekend. And but we're trying to go also step by step. Let's go from a more simple approach and then let's try it. Let's compare it with the previous approach. And then let's try to see whether a more complex approach really generates more benefits. If not, we um, we can assume that for the purpose of the project would be enough. Uh, we are still developing the tool. Um, we were uh, doing some examples in order to prove the, the functionality and also possibility of the results. And we took these uh, neighborhoods in Munich. Sorry, in part of Munich. regarding the previous. And which is the time step you use for each to yeah. understand the dynamics? It's, it depends on the period of time and the indicator you want to use. We um, we move from 15 minutes to one hour, but we could even do, uh, do it in seconds. But the problem is that um, you have, it depends also on the quality of the input data. We have input data for electricity uh, uh, profiling households of one second. But then you, also, you have occupation profiles of one hour. So in the end, it's like the question that we ask ourselves is, is um, does it make sense or is it worth doing everything more complex, more detailed, even if we are also making have high assumptions on another aspects? Or maybe it's better just to go to a middle point in which we do it technically feasible and we still have a uh, plausible results. So that's why instead of seconds, we go to 15 minutes. We then simulate just one week or two weeks. If we want to go for a whole year simulation, we jump to the hourly um, the simulation. So, and this is like, a big uh, example that we use for the development, um, in which we created the green uh, geometry, we did the solar radiation analysis, and we did exported all the information we needed. And this is an example of three optimization objectives that we have implemented, in which we want to, to, to investigate what how would be the change of the electricity consumption in the building, if we will focus on reducing operation costs, reducing CO2 emissions, or reducing the peak loads for the power system. I chose this for showing you the results because it's the one in which you see more clearly the effect of the optimizer. This could be like the reference test scenario. This could be like the optimizer scenario. In this column, you have the power balance in the neighborhoods and the heat balance. You see here, for example, like how the so negative values means consumption and is production. You have here the uh, PV panel production, and you see here how this PV panel is their production is much more used in this scenario than here. Here is rather hidden in the electricity grid, while here is stored and used for the heat production in the heat pump. So, so one question, what do you really optimize? The use of the heat pumps? In this case, what you um, reduce is the amount, the peak loads um, of your demand. So you don't, you don't stress the uh, power system. Yeah, but the, the actuation is over the, the heat pumps. Ah, exactly. over, over the electrical, all the electrical loads. We control the heat pumps okay. and the uh, electric cars charging. Ah, the electrical cars too. Yeah. Okay. So actually, batteries here means electric car. I thought we assumed the uh, electric cars is like uh, some patterns of. We have two so different approaches. So we have a study which is modern. I know it's happening now, but. 
it's um, statistically uh, it tells you uh, depending on the neighborhood topology when normally people come with the car for how long they stay how many kilometers they travel so based on this we can more or less dimension the the, the electric cars and then for the charging strategy we uh, take into account two options one of them is saying the person comes plug in and it uh, is charged continuously until it's a it's fully charged so it's like a, the, standard. The, the standard operation and we also consider like a more intelligent way in which the the, the, the person comes plug in and says i need the car by 8 a.m tomorrow and then the system decided whether now it is being charged or later on yeah you are using like some uh, normal normal distances uh, mm -hmm. exactly yeah yeah like these are all hours they are doing four exactly. kilometers per we use we need to charge them. Yeah. So we don't invent these standards, we take them from uh, statistical studies. Yeah. Here in Spain, there is also also. In the second casuistic where the client said the hour that he wanted the, she wanted the car um, charge, okay. you are also using a bidirectional charger. You can use the bidirectional is like you yeah. feeding Yeah, you can fit in a we contemplate the possibility for investigating this as well but you are not going to do it um yes we uh, okay. if if we manage to implement this yes um i like the question because this became a final slide in the end the expected outcomes in this project is trying to define um a specific renovation strategies for these different scenarios, um, in order to do recommendations, catalog of recommendations for uh, professionals and also for uh, public funding agencies, in order to tell them, look, um, these uh, renovation strategies you have with funding, they are actually effective in this and this way. And if you complement this with this and this other taking into account the use of energy flexibility, you make more out of it. And uh, the third point is the third point is the last one, but not the less important. We want to explore ways of um, uh, making profit of the energy flexibility. So making market marketing the energy flexibility um, in order to use this as an incentive for increasing the renovation rate that is lacking at the moment. And for this, we want to investigate different electricity tariffs, different uh, demand response programs, incentives, and also the possibility for using the, the, the batteries of the electric cars, or just like an additional storage system you can use in your building. So I mean, in the end, the overall goal of this project is to contribute to what we said at the beginning, the coping, the interaction of the sectors, and the final end of uh, Decarbonizing the energy system and you know, meeting the goals of the union that we have. Thank you very much. Um, I was yes. asked to comment one, one slide. Uh, the, in the slide, I think, 27. There was a there was a, a two graphics about the, the energy production of Germany. And, and I was surprised about the, the, the increase of the energy production. I, I, I'm not sure I get the, the, the slide. This one. No, the previous one, maybe. This one. No, oh, the, 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 the forecast for 2045. Well, this is just an example. Yeah. It's, not, okay. it's part of the theoretical level. Okay, yeah. Well, as this is the result of one of the scenario that it was um, uh, modeled in this dissertation, uh -huh. which was developing the power system model that we use for our second project. Yeah. And this is, this might be one specific day 
in which the amount of wind power in the environment is higher. Oh, okay, this is energy for energy power. Exactly. So that is production, while this is consumption. This is the residual. Okay. Thank you, Manuel. Uh, is there any other question from the people that is connected online? No? Yes? I explain what it is. Please speak because we are we, we hear you very well. So no. No okay. questions here. Yeah. Yes. Mm -hmm. This question. Ah, no question. Ah, no question. A technical question. If the objective is to decarbonize the building sector, when are are these studies considering the um the the CO2 cost of enhancing the building sector. You mean the, if we consider life cycle assessment? And not the life cycle, but I don't know, the, the, the price of, of changing the, the, the walls or the yes, I windows. So what is the, um, or the embodied the, energy of the materials yeah, that you need yeah, to of, of, of yeah. We don't do that. Because that you had be, a, a graph where you showed the, the evolution. Yes, like we focus on the operation part. Okay, and do you not think this cost is, cost is significant? Yeah, but um, we we support this decision mm -hmm. in other studies that have shown that renovating is um, less no, right. uh, <laughs> carbon print. Mm -hmm. uh, intensive than demolishing a new building. Okay. Uh, so we have had studies in our own shirt on students, and also we have consulted other studies in which they 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 had this question, the research question: what is better in terms of carbon footprint, demolish a new building or to adapt an existing building? Yes, by Using the embodied energy that the building has already, uh, this uh, com compensates all the addition of new materials. But in the, uh, if you take into account that nowadays or previously everything was built not with the intention of being dismantling afterwards, so basically 98% of the building when you demolish it, you have to throw it out, you cannot reuse it, or it's very Carbon intensive uh, to be reused, like for example the the, the concrete or the stones. So in order to be able to be reused, you have to put a lot of energy in on that. So yeah, but definitely life cycle analysis are very important topic, and we would love to include it in further studies. But at the moment, we need to like yeah, set the scope yeah. uh, to make it possible. For us, it's not difficult to manage how much. Um, yeah. Um, simulation effort we need to put on the spot. I have some questions. Also. Yeah. In, more in the electrical field, maybe it's a little bit out of the main topic of this because you're more focused on the uh, building side. But uh, with Panda Power, you're only simulating low, low voltage, low voltage. you are not in maybe yeah. exactly. And you are trying to. Um, also supply uh, what is your optimization there trying to not have congestion or voltage drop and that's all or you are also trying to supply other um services to the grid I don't know. Mm -hmm. maybe those are the more important things. so uh, thank you very much for the questions i have to tell you that uh, we are collaborating with the electrotechnical department so oh, okay. <laughs> We have a colleague which is more expert in the electrical part and he's the one that is in charge of the panel power. So if you have any specific question, you can ask me, I can put you in contact and it might. <laughs> and um, but yes, so what we everything since we are studying this coupling between sectors, for us, one of the things we want to study is if there is a 
big uh, demand or a situation in the in the power grid, the world dispute, in which um, we might have stressed the lines. Mm -hmm. Let's try to reduce the consumption in the neighborhood so in order to hit the yeah, balance. Yeah, so you are balancing also the grid state with the simulation that exactly. you're doing. The so we want well. to impact the grid yeah. state. And what we want to further study is how can the neighborhood economically benefit of, of that? Okay. So because if the buildings then start acting not as a passive consumer, but as a flexumer, maybe it can get a profit mm -hmm. from the grid. Mm -hmm. And this profit can be used to fund the renovation action that's actually allowed for that uh, new use, a new, uh, yeah. You also, you also use it in the economical um, optimization. Exactly. Okay. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And our wish is to combine multi objecting uh, optimization, no. but it's very complicated. Yes. So we do it step by step. So, yeah. But we also consider how much money do you need for inventing the building, the new renovated state? How, can, how much? Um, um energy costs you can reduce by uh, taking advantage of the on-site power generation and we want to implement these incentive tariffs mm -hmm. so everything will be taken into account thank you very much so any further questions then thank you very much again um if you have any other question afterwards, just please contact me and we'll be very happy to answer you. Thank you, everybody. We close the, the season. Bye bye. Have a nice Friday and weekend.